Hello and welcome to another episode of the Clinage webinar series. My name is Georgia and I'll be your moderator today. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, Clinage hosts webinars each month partnering with experts in the industry. We strive to cover various topics on clinical research, including but not limited to operations and optimization, patient recruitment and retention, financial services, technology, and more. We invite and encourage experts from all realms of the healthcare industry to present in our webinar series to promote learning, idea exchange, and progress. We will have a few poll questions during the webinar today, and those will pop up right on your screen. Today's presentation is called How to Maximize Your Chances of Converting FQs to Study Awards, and I would like to introduce today's presenter, Mallory Thomas. Mallory is the Director of Site Relations at ClinEdge, where she helps to increase business and improve operations for clinical research sites, while also streamlining the study startup process for sponsors and CROs. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them at any time on the box on the right side panel of your screen. There will be about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A session. I will be asking the questions out loud at that time. Any questions not addressed may be answered in a follow-up blog post or answered directly by email. So without further ado, here is Mallory. Thank you, Georgia. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as Georgia stated, I'm, my name is Mallory Thomas. I've been working at ClinEdge um, for the past four years now. And as Georgia kind of indicated, I work a lot on both the sponsor and the site side, um, specifically to help with um, more on the sponsor side, site ID and startup. Um, so I've, I see a lot of questions and I get a lot of questions on a consistent basis from sites um, regarding how to really maximize their chances of getting awarded a study. I know the atmosphere is increasingly competitive, so um, what seems like kind of a formal step in the process is actually really important in kind of getting your foot in the door. Um, and as a more kind of blunt question that I receive on a, on a daily basis is why am I submitting so many feasibility questionnaires but not getting anything? Um, so I thought this was a pretty relevant topic and I'm happy to share kind of my insight on what I like to call the art and the science of feasibility completion. So I will just jump right into it. So we're actually going to start with a little poll. Um, and uh, so essentially we're, we're going to kind of just put it out there. Um, what is even really the point of submitting a feasibility questionnaire to begin with? Great, thank you everyone for filling that out. Um, it looks about 82% uh, answered to get awarded to a study, um, and then 15% to get on a sponsor's radar. Perfect, okay. So, yeah, we wanted to start with this question. Um, basically, you know, among all of the feasibilities that we see on a daily basis, um, it can be really overwhelming. I think sometimes we even lose sight of, okay, what is actually the point of filling this out? Um, I think it's helpful to remember that filling out a feasibility is not just a means to an end. Of course, we want to ultimately get awarded a study, but we also have to keep in mind that as we fill them out, one of the main reasons for um, you know, this kind of technicality is to really create an open dialogue with the sponsor. Um, is the study really going to be feasible for me as a site? Is the study feasible in general? Um, it's definitely a two-way street, um, sort of like a job application. You wouldn't apply for something that you don't know much about or all of the details on. Um, so I would really use the feasibility stage as you know, an opportunity to really establish clear expectations up front with the sponsor about you know, your ability to successfully recruit in the trial, all of the appropriate details of the trial um, that would, you know, ultimately lead you to decide, okay, is this even a good fit for my site? Um, and if it's not a good fit, you don't need to submit for every single opportunity that comes your way um, because ultimately that might even, you know, hurt your chances with the sponsor in the future. 
and it'll obviously waste a lot of precious time on the site side of things. So how do we really get on the same page with a sponsor up front? How do we begin to understand, okay, is this a feasible study for my site? What do I need to know? So it's really about starting that dialogue and asking questions. Um, so some of these questions I highlighted, and, and these are really all of the questions that um, you know, my team asks sponsors on, and CROs on a daily basis, essentially, before feeling comfortable um, to send a study opportunity to one of the sites that I work with, I want to make sure that I'm getting all of these details up front, or at least most of them. Um, so specialty, what specialty does the PI need to be? Um, sometimes it can be very arbitrary, but, um, but it also can kind of make or break your chances. So, um, you know, if it's an acne study that your family medicine physician is really interested in, they've done a lot of acne trials in the past, um, but the sponsor is really targeting board-certified dermatologists, it can be really frustrating when you're ultimately declined um, the study, despite having that relevant experience. So if we're asking up front, um, you would know to, you know, if they're requiring a dermatologist, you'd know to either contract with one, put forth maybe a sub-eye that you work with, um, or even just initially uh, making a case as to why you're submitting a family practitioner and, you know, what um, the relevant, you know, scales or assessments that, that he or she has practiced in the past that would make him a good fit um, for the study. Um, when is FPI? So you definitely don't want to go through the trouble of filling out a feasibility if you have a competing study opportunity. Um, this I kind of take with a grain of salt, though. I mean, FPI, as you guys know, ships all the time. I think the more important question here to ask is when is LPI, if it's an ongoing opportunity. Um, I've had sites fill out feasibilities for ongoing studies. Uh, only to get initiated and then they're told, okay, enrollment's ending in a few weeks, which is obviously very frustrating on the site side. Um, how many sites are you seeking? How many patients are you seeking per site per month? How long is enrollment? Um, these questions kind I kind of group together. Um, I think it's always important to understand that middle one, how many patients are you seeking per site per month? Because it'll kind of give you an idea as to whether that recruitment rate is feasible for your site and it'll kind of guide you in terms of whether you're going to be moving forward. Sometimes sponsors don't love giving that answer just because they want to see what numbers the site is, you know, realistically putting forth. Um, but I think you can, we can always pretty much figure it out based on the enrollment duration, the number of sites they're looking at, um, and then the total number of patients randomized. So I think if we can get a good picture of that, it'll really help us out in the long run. Um, are there any specific requirements that you're seeking in the ideal site for the study? Um, I really love the transparency of this question. I think the sponsor should definitely want to answer this, right? Um, I think anything specific that you can get in terms of who they're ideally seeking is going to be really helpful. And then, are there any specific equipment needed in order to do the study? Um, I wouldn't, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, I wouldn't use equipment or lack of equipment as a reason to necessarily decline the study up front, um, but it is important to know, um, especially if you might, you know, be thinking about purchasing it or, um, or if it's a study that you're extremely interested in, but you may not have that specific equipment. And then finally, am I able to sign a CDA in order to review a full protocol? Um, this is a good question, especially if they're just providing a synopsis. Um, I think it's hard to really truly fill out a feasibility questionnaire if you don't have a lot of those nitty-gritty details, um, full inclusion, exclusion criteria, schedule of events. Um, sometimes he'll even ask about budget, and it's obviously really hard to even project a potential budget without at least the schedule of assessments. So asking for more information never hurts, and uh, the worst that they can say is no. So my next point is communication. So um, this goes beyond kind of the initial communication with the sponsor that I just touched on, you know, regarding the specifics of the study opportunity and the feasibility. Um, here, what I'm talking about really is communicating any deadlines or any delays that you may anticipate in getting the feasibility back to the sponsor. 
Um, I know that with the sites that you know I work with, we really emphasize our ability to turn around the feasibility questionnaire in three days, three business days, um, and that's pretty much the timeline that sponsors give. Um, I won't say CROs because I know those timelines can be extremely fast, um, but I would just say if you know ahead of time that you're going to be out of the office um, or you need more time to run numbers, or you're just busy, if you communicate that need for an extension to the sponsor, um, they're generally okay with that as long as you provide some kind of reasoning. Um, I would just emphasize, you know, if communication drops during this feasibility stage um, or if, it, you know, if there are long lapses in communication, that really reflects, um, you know, what working with your site might be like if you're actually awarded the study. It's kind of a little glimpse into, you know, what working with, with the site would be on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a great chance to... It's a, it's a great chance to make a good first impression, but there's also the chance of making a not so great impression. Um, if you turn everything around really quickly, um, it really only re-emphasizes your interest in the study. And as you know, it's so competitive out there. Sometimes just, you know, speed of turnaround is really um, the key to kind of getting ahead. So the next couple slides, um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some general feasibility advice that I talk about um, with my sites pretty much on a regular basis. Um, and then after this kind of general advice, we'll jump into more of uh, real world examples of um, what sites have put on feasibility questionnaires and we can kind of delve a little bit deeper into, you know, more practical applications of this advice. So the first bullet point, stressing your database recruitment from a practice or established referral sources is preferable to stressing advertising. So this is almost always a question on a feasibility questionnaire, um, kind of giving a breakdown of where exactly these patients are and how you're going to get them in the study. Um, I would say that sponsors almost always choose sites that have access to the patients via the database or practice, um, rather than saying that they're going to get their patients from advertising. And this is from both a cost perspective and also a patient perspective. So if the site has patients from a database or from a practice, chances are the patients have either participated in a study before with the site or they trust the physician because the physicians, the you know, um, giving giving the patient care on a regular basis and he's or she is the PI. Um, and also from a cost pers perspective, the, the sponsor doesn't want to, you know, put, you know, bring on a site that's going to need a $10,000 advertising budget if another site can, you know, provide those same patients or the same quality patients through a practice. Um, so I would always emphasize, you know, never putting m more than 25 to even 30% from advertising. Um, with that said, there's always some sort of, um, you know, there's always an indication where advertising is going to be necessary. There are definitely instances where advertising can be extremely successful. So what I would say there is, um, I would just add in as much detail as possible. You know, if you're gonna put that you're, you're probably gonna re rely 50% on advertising, I would just add in, uh, you know, how you've successfully utilized advertising in the past on a similar study. Um, I think as much detail as we can provide there is going to be beneficial because ultimately the sponsor is going to want to know, okay, if you're going to need 50% advertising, we want to know where those funds are going to, you know, how that would be successful, why you're choosing, you know, this particular route. The next, um, the next bullet point stresses metrics. So I definitely think that these are extremely important in submitting um, whether or not you're being explicitly asked for them in the questionnaire. Um, you know, if a sponsor is just asking about prior experience and all you're, we're really putting is yes, it's not really saying a whole lot. Um, I would always add relevant study metrics where you're listing um, prior experience, and I would make sure you're including, you know, the mode of administration, um, what the enrollment duration was, the number of subjects screened, randomized, um, 
an ideal world, we want to put forth really good numbers. Um, on the other hand, if you have experience and this, the numbers aren't the greatest, I would just explain why. Um, there's always room on the FQ, there's always, you know, you're always able to add in more, um, whether or not they're actually asking. So, you know, if you had study experience, but um, the numbers aren't the best or you didn't need enrollment, um, just add in some additional notes. Was it a challenging protocol where you added on to the study? Um, you know, when enrollment was beginning to come to a close, there's always more to that story, so just be sure to tell that story. The next bullet point is if you're interested but don't have experience, show what other resources you do have. And um, this is definitely a topic that I discuss with sites on a regular basis. I could probably do another webinar just on this topic. Um, there are so many other ways that you can showcase what resources you have, even if you don't have study experience. Um, I would say it's just important to frame everything in a really positive way. Um, so just some kind of general tips on this, uh, on this point would say leverage your prior experience in a different indication that relates in some way to the current study. So for example, I work with a lot of sites that really want to get into the healthy volunteer space, which everybody knows is very competitive. I don't know a single site that wouldn't want a healthy volunteer vaccine. Um, so for sites that don't have that experience, rather than putting zero for the number of prior vaccine studies, um, I always encourage them to add a little bit of, you know, add a little something and draw from prior experience in a similar type of study. So maybe they haven't done a vaccine study, but they've, all, they've done high volume studies in the past where they've had to recruit patients in a really short time frame. Um, and they've had to, you know, really proactively uh, plan what resources they're allocating to that study to hit that goal. Um, that parallels healthy volunteer vaccine studies in a lot of ways, even if it's not the same indication, really shows the sponsor, okay, we know that you're going to want a lot of patients in the quickest amount of time and we can do that because we've done it in the past. Um, so just thinking outside of the box a little bit. Another way to kind of get around the lack of experience is drawing on the clinical experience of the PI. So perhaps, you know, the PI hasn't done an osteoarthritis study in the past, but they perform 50 intra-articular intra injections a week, um, and they're really well-versed on all of the rating skills that would be necessary for the protocol. So based upon um, his or her clinical experience the, and the overall site study experience that combined um, would make that site a really good fit for that particular study. And that's a lot more compelling than just putting no, no experience. Um, Another kind of way to get around it is just using other resources. So do you work with any sub-eyes? Do you work with um, any other practices that, you know, might have that experience that are willing to kind of jump in as a sub-eye or co-investigator? Even if a coordinator has prior experience and they give an indication from, you know, another site or another um, role that they've filled, that to me still counts and classifies as experience. Um, it doesn't have to be so black and white. Um, you know, we can definitely be creative and, and again, think outside of the box a little bit. So, yeah, the bottom line is when you have no experience, it's definitely an uphill battle, um, but it is very possible to still get awarded a study based upon the detail of your feasibility and um, really the amount of time and thought you're willing to put into it. Um, and then finally, this should kind of go without saying, but don't leave any questions blank. Um, be as detailed as possible regarding, you know, your prior successes. If you leave anything blank, it just kind of shows that you don't care a whole lot about getting the study or you don't have attention to detail. So any blanks, I think, are a really big red flag, and it certainly slows the process down even more. Okay, and just to continue off of this, um, so just a couple more bullet points, and I'll skip over the first one because we did talk about that one already. Um, utilizing all potential recruitment resources, so what does that exactly mean? So when sponsors ask what the approximate number of patients you have access to with whatever indication it is, 
I wouldn't just estimate based upon the number of patients in your database. So I would think all angles, so referrals, the PI's practice, sub I's practice, even advertising if it makes sense for that indication, everything combined should yield that number. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of sites kind of sell themselves short by just putting the number um, within their database because based upon how the question is worded, that's kind of how it, it appears. But I would just really keep in mind using all of the potential resources you have available. The next little bullet point, make an impression. Don't just be another site. Um, how do we do that? Sponsors are flooded with feasibility responses every day. Um, for one, I think just turnaround time is huge. It seems really simple, but I think the first, uh, the first couple of feasibilities to me that says, okay, these are probably the most interested sites. Um, I would also always use the comment section at the very end, which I know that almost all feasibilities that I've seen um, have a little space for any extra comments. Just a couple sentences where you're emphasizing, you know, how excited the site is for the study, um, looking forward to scheduling a PSV. Um, if you have any questions, contact me at, you know, whatever email or phone number. I think adding a little something definitely goes a long way. And then um, the final point here, limitations on the protocol. So acknowledging any protocol limitations up front is helpful. Um, I definitely wouldn't frame anything negatively, but if there was a specific part of the protocol that's maybe causing your recruitment projections to be lower um, than a typical study in that indication, you should acknowledge that and be really transparent with your feedback um, because the sponsor will really appreciate it. It shows that you're taking the time to actually read the protocol or the synopsis and uh, it shows that you're really invested in, um, you know, essentially getting the study. All right, so we're going to do another poll, um, and this time it is deciding whether or not you're actually filling out a feasibility. We get a lot of opportunities on a daily basis, but how do we actually decide which ones we're going to be moving forward with and which ones we're not? Great, we'll take a, just a couple more seconds. Okay, um, it looks like if you have all the capabilities to complete was the highest answer and about tied for the next ones for interesting indication or sponsor and if the PI says yes, interested. Perfect. Awesome, okay. So I would say that, you know, deciding and weighing a lot of these variables in terms of actually going forward with filling out a feasibility is definitely important. Um, my general rule of thumb is if you are interested in the indication and or interested in breaking in with that sponsor and there's no major hurdle, I would just go for it. Um, remember that filling out a feasibility questionnaire is not the same as actually committing to the study. Just like applying for a job interview is not the same as committing to that company. So I wouldn't let a little uh, minute details dissuade you from filling out a feasibility. Um, I know we kind of touched on equipment previously, but if you don't have a certain, um, if you don't have certain equipment, you can always purchase it down the line or even get the sponsor to cover, you know, to cover the cost or at least a portion of the cost. Um, it might really be a good long-term investment in working with that sponsor. So I wouldn't let that kind of dissuade you off the bat. Um, same with staff. I would say, you know, we can always contract additional staff. Um, we can contract additional raters, just depending on the particular study opportunity. Um, additionally, I would say, um, and this isn't on the slide necessarily, but I would say don't decline off the bat based on FPI. I know we mentioned that previously as something to ask about, which I think it's definitely still very useful information to have, but I wouldn't let that um, dissuade you from the study opportunity just based on knowing that FPI shifts all the time and that there's probably a good shot um, that it will move 
um, somewhat, unless it's a super quick startup study. Um, the little note at the bottom about not showing a PI every synopsis, uh, so it, it seems a little counterintuitive, but it will ultimately slow the process down. Um, if you're the person submitting your site's feasibility questionnaires, then you should ultimately know what would be a good fit and what wouldn't. Um, so, and you know, even further, half the time we're only getting a synopsis or a brief breakdown of the study protocol. So, um, you know, that criteria can easily shift and you know, make or break a decision as time goes on as well. So I say move full speed ahead with indications of interest, core areas for your site, um, even if, you know, even if everything doesn't fall into place um, perfectly initially, I would say just, you know, move forward with it. Um, because how many feasibilities does it take to even land a study opportunity? And I would also add in, don't let a low budget, if they're giving budget information up front, don't let a low budget dissuade you either, especially if it's a new area for your site. Um, obviously, we need to be smart about, you know, revenue. Nobody wants to be in the negatives from taking on a study opportunity. But sometimes breaking into a new area and taking on lower paying studies is really what kind of gets the ball rolling with experience on the CV and eventually getting one of those higher paying studies down the road. All right, so now we're going to move into some real-world examples of some of the feedback that I've already given. Um, and these, I should note, are actually real feasibilities from sites um, that I've worked with over the years. Okay, so just as a breakdown, this, this kind of alludes to patient access. Um, here, the sponsor, like we mentioned earlier, typical question, how is, uh, what does the patient breakdown look like? Where are those patients coming from? So this site put 40% from the database, 20% from referrals, 40% from advertising. If you have a high rate of potential referrals, please explain in detail how you recruit through those referrals. The site said we have a strong referral network. And then if you have a high rate from advertising, how do you recruit from advertising? Advertising has always been effective. So that brings us to our next poll. So what, what would this site, um, what could this site have done differently in their answers? Again, okay, we'll just take a couple, couple seconds for you guys to fill this one out. All right, so it looks like 63% said increased percentage from database. All right, so definitely increasing the percentage from your database or even referrals would be a good move. I think, um, you know, a huge proportion from advertising with a very little explanation does not make that site look great in the sponsor's mind. Um, and then in talking about their referral network, um, they didn't really provide a lot of detail, but this site here wrote that they have three orthophysician practices within their area, that they've referred patients to um, their site for the past seven years. Um, they even gave an example of, you know, the actual numbers of patients that they've enrolled via that referral source, which goes a really long way, I think, especially emphasizing that they've worked with them for seven years. Um, is huge because referrals are really all about trust and sponsors want to know that you have a really established relationship with, you know, whoever is referring those patients to you. And then in the bottom section about advertising, the prior response was pretty um, short. They didn't elaborate really on how advertising has worked for them in the past, but this site wrote a nice little blurb, um, each time we're able to receive an average of $10,000. We enrolled eight and six patients um, in, into the past studies, and then we've also enrolled several patients utilizing online ads. Um, so this was great. I think that they could have even um, gone a little bit further and saying, you know, why 
based upon their specific geographic area and based upon their patient population, why, um, why online ads or why radio ads worked for them well? Was it because that particular um, geographic area and population had a lot of people who are you know, commuters via you know, car every day or they managed transit ads that were successful because they targeted somebody on their way to work who really fit that patient profile. So even going so far as to say why those certain advertising methods worked for that site I think will be um, definitely beneficial. Okay, so this is a little example on just really reading what the sponsor is looking for. Um, oftentimes we do have a lot of information, we're just not spending the adequate amount of time to really understand it. So um, it's saying really right there, please do not complete the feasibility if the site is incapable of recruiting 25 patients in the amount of time. Um, we're also seeking sites that have conducted a number of OA studies. We won't be able to consider any first-time PIs for this study. Um, so off the bat, the I mean, question number 64 in four weeks, they're, they're saying that they can recruit three to four patients. So that's drastically lower than what the sponsor is looking for. Um, and it doesn't change too much even with the addition of advertising. Um, so those were the two kind of glaring errors, I think, in this, you know, in this example is just the site's really not reading what the sponsor, the sponsor is giving you their expectations. We don't even have to ask for it. And yet we're still not uh, putting down numbers that are reflective of that. This example, um, this is a pretty typical request from a sponsor, um, just kind of soliciting prior enrollment numbers. Um, the site here put down that they enrolled um, 12, 10, 10 patients in prior OA of the knee studies. Um, it looks like the recruitment periods were pretty long, um, so definitely not high volume studies. Um, and then when the sites or when the sponsor asks about, um, you know, understanding their prior metrics in more detail, um, they wrote your studies criteria is much easier than our prior OA studies we've conducted. Um, so they definitely want to elaborate a little bit here. So this. This person's feasibility questionnaire, they had very similar numbers, so very similar enrollment rates, longer, um, longer studies, but um, you know, still only enrolling about 10 patients in over a year, over a year and a half. Um, but so that's fine. We just want to be detailed as they are in the below section as to why they were a bit lower than you know, what this particular study is looking for. So just saying your study's criteria is much easier doesn't give much insight, um, whereas this site is really explaining, okay, why so many patients screen failed in our prior OA studies um, based upon, you know, the Womack pain scale. If, you know, if this study in particular is going to be different in various areas, they can make a case and say, based upon your criteria, our numbers, we would expect to be more than double um, because they're nailing down those specifics. And then some additional information. This is a really great example of leveraging other resources and using other resources to really get your foot in the door with an indication you don't have experience. So this PI did not have specific trial experience in OA of the knee, but you know they do have experience in other pain indications. They were a top enroller in a chronic low back pain. Um, and then th they also utilized their coordinator experience, as I mentioned previously, three of um, you know, that their coordinators participated in a variety of OA studies. Um, they also mentioned their referring clinics, and they use a lot of numbers. So I think sponsors are always very numbers driven. So I would always encourage adding in hard, hard data if possible. The only thing I would say here with this blurb is I wouldn't even start it by saying, although our PI doesn't have specific clinical trial experience, I, I still would never, I still read that and I think it's kind of framed negatively. So I would try to reframe that in a more positive way, but also hitting really all of the points that they've hit on. 
All right, so your feasibility questionnaire is complete. Um, so now what? How do you really convert that submission to a pre-study a pre-study visit or an, you know eventually an award? So a couple of things that I would suggest um, in submitting, I would always kind of reaffirm your interest in the email, let them know if you're available available for a call, if they have any follow-up questions. Um, and I would really proactively um, touch on any areas in the feasibility where you're not sure if, if you know, the site is going to be an ideal fit in the sponsor's mind. If you don't have that experience, I would take the pretty much same blurb that you write in the feasibility and just put it right in the email and let the sponsor know up front. You know, we have experience through this, this, and this. The PI doesn't have that desired experience, but we can be successful because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I also mentioned a one sheet based on, you know, whatever specific therapeutic area your site um, does research in. I think, you know, attaching a one sheet or study metrics um, or even a more general sheet that talks about your site's infrastructure and how, um, you know, experienced you guys are. I think that's always a really good idea. Um, reconfirming patient population prior experience, like I mentioned, and then, um, you know, always personalizing the email, um, pulling out that specific information in the synopsis. And then finally, a, another question um, that comes up is how frequently should sites follow up with the project manager once the feasibility is completed and sent in? Um, I would say this varies based on study timelines. So if they say upfront PSVs won't be starting for another three months or so, um, or the study isn't starting for over a year, I wouldn't be necessarily following up with them every week because that's just gonna annoy them. Um, I would even ask them what the appropriate time frame is for follow-ups um, and let them kind of define those timelines themselves. Um, I think you can't really go wrong when you, when you look at it from that perspective. Um, and if they're not really giving you anything, I think, you know, if you, if you don't know anything with time, timelines regarding steady startup or anything, I think checking in every two weeks can't hurt. Yeah, and so just to kind of wrap things up, I think, um, you know, the feasibility questionnaire process, it's tedious, and sometimes it feels like every sponsor is kind of reinventing the wheel um, just with the questions they're asking, and I know that it can get frustrating, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, there's a lot of variables we can't control in getting a study. There's geographic restraints. Um, sponsors are often looking for less, uh, fewer sites. Um, there's always going to be delays and holds. Um, so there's a lot of areas we can't really do anything about, but I think feasibility quality is an area that we can control. Um, and I hope that, you know, based upon these tips, you have some more insight on how to really maximize your chances of getting awarded more studies for your site. Great. Thank you so much, Mallory. Uh, we did have a couple questions that came in. Um, one of them is for sites that are hospitals, returning a feasibility questionnaire that asks about total population and requests information about the facility is easy to turn around in three days, um, but they do get many that ask for more detailed information, um, and it's near impossible for the PI to complete the FQ in three days. And do you have any advice for that or how you would suggest balancing that? Yeah, that's a great question. I do work with a couple hospital-based sites, and I understand that it can take a lot more time, um, and especially, you know, based on how detailed the feasibility really gets. Um, I would say that, you know, it's it all goes back to managing expectations and just to managing um, communication, you know, managing deadlines, essentially. So if, if you're pretty much done with most of the questions, but you're just waiting on certain numbers to be pulled and, or, you know, you're waiting to confirm something with the PI, I would just continually communicate that to whoever you're speaking to on the sponsor level um, and just you know, constantly update them that you're working on it. You're still very invested in the study. You're still very interested in being considered, but based upon X, Y, and Z, you're probably not going to be able to get a fully completed questionnaire until, you know, whatever deadline. 
Great, thanks. Um, and also, are there any differences in strategy in filling out an FQ from a CRO versus from a sponsor? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so CROs that are bidding on opportunities, I think it just comes down to really understanding what the CRO is asking for. Sometimes they're asking for, um, you know, protocol feedback, budget feedback versus site feedback. Um, and I know that a lot of sites kind of get frustrated with the number of pre-awarded feasibilities they're filling out with very little uh, return. So I would say with CROs, just be be selective. Um, I would target the indications that your site is really interested in. Um, otherwise, I think it'll lead to a lot of frustration. But ultimately, I think all, a lot of the tactics should really be the same in actually completing them. Um, you know, CRO relationships, even though it's frustrating to get a lot of pre-awards, those relationships are just as important as sponsor relationships. So I think um, really just utilizing those tactics for, um, for both will ultimately lead to success. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and also, what about the rule that sponsors cut the numbers in half? Uh, where's the line between being realistic and too conservative? Yeah, that's a question I get a lot. Um, so every sponsor is going to be different. Every CRO is going to be different. Some will assume that the numbers are high and, like you said, kind of cut them down a little bit. And some some just kind of take them as they are. Um, so you can't, it's hard to predict unless you really know a sponsor well or you worked with a CRO a lot. Um, so I would say, you know, it really just goes back to providing as much detail as possible. Um, if you're putting three patients a month, but um, you know, they're looking for sites that are going to recruit 10 patients a month. I would explain what in the protocol is making you hesitate in inflating that number. Um, same thing if you're putting down a really large number, because um, that too can deter a sponsor from taking your site um, onto a study. You know, if you put, you're going to recruit 20 patients a month for an OA study, yeah, it seems high, but based upon the criteria and based upon previous similar studies that you've run, this has really this uh, recruitment method had, has worked for us and this is how we were able to yield such a high volume. So it's really, it just goes back to providing as much detail as possible um, and actually having that dialogue with the sponsor. Mm -hmm. So we also have another one that came in a couple times. Um, what if there's no space to elaborate on our answers? Sometimes they only ask for numbers and we can't add in any reasons why. Do you have any advice for that? Yeah, so I think um, in those instances, so the feasibility questionnaire always has to come from somebody. I would always go back to that initial email and see if you can't find a contact, um, either a site ID person or somebody that can kind of pass you up the chain to hopefully the project manager where you can, um, you know, where you can have a chance to really add that detail because I, I do think the detail is important. Great. So I think that might be it for uh, one more question. Um, I have received several FQs that are asking, based on the information you were provided, what do you estimate you will request per subject? Um, do you have tips on putting something other than to be determined? So just to make sure I understand the question, um, so are we asking what our kind of general rule of thumb is in projecting what a um, recruitment rate would be? Uh, yeah, that's what the question is. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's totally dependent on the indication and the study protocol. I think that's why asking for more information or as much information up front as possible um, is important. So, and I think otherwise all you can really rely on is historical metrics. So if it's an acne study and you've done, you know, five acne studies in the past and they've all kind of averaged around, you know, five patients per month, that's kind of what I would put down, um, but it, it just kind of depends on that specific indication, the administration route, and, you know, a lot of other variables. Great. Well, if there are any additional questions, you can feel free to ask them right now, um, but if not, we will reach out to you that asked any questions to make sure that we answer them accordingly, and I think that's it for today. So thank you so much for attending and stay tuned for the rest of our webinar series.